G'day guys, welcome back to this another episode of the Social Distance Podcast. It's an absolute cracker. Um, we digress into a many different directions. We go in a lot of wormholes and we cover a lot of shit. But we do cover the art of how to crash in a time trial. We do discuss how to live as an amateur on fuck all money. Um, and with George discusses New Zealand Cycle Classic. We talk about my departure to Europe in a few days. Jonesy, we discussed whether Jonesy had COVID or not. We're pretty sure he did, but stay tuned to find out. I had 100% didn't like, share, subscribe. Bullshit. Did you just declare the winner of the intro? That's a cracker. Fishing without even declaring Pe- it. Peter, oh, Peter, Me- Peter Meffin. Remember the name. Remember the song. That is a belter. He's nailed it. All right. <laughs> That's it then. Congrats, <laughs> right. mate. George, you'd, <laughs> have, you'd have to be. Like you're the... <laughs> I'm excited. You're on that, Jonesy. <laughs> All right, yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited. I don't think, I don't think you're going to get a better one. But I just think you've gone against the spirit of competition and just there's probably people out there just ferreting away on an intro and you've just cut their lunch and gone, oh, this guy's coming early. We're calling it. And you've declared. No, like many competitions we've run on this show in the past, we don't get a lot of bites to the cherry. So I I reckon we've peaked after a week and I reckon we need to call it. Well, that's like the, the prick that ended up in the Maldives. He probably was yeah. the only guy that ended yeah. the competition. He ended up with yeah. the on holiday. Well, he sent a photo, didn't he, Bills? He's, hey, he's oh, did in he the make good it? books for yeah, he's in the good books for about a year after that trip, I reckon. He was there last week. Yeah. Was he? How yeah, I go? saw the I saw the Amilla uh Amilla Resorts in, in the Maldives. I follow them on and well, we follow them on Instagram, um, our social distance podcast account. And I saw on their story, I was like, Andy Turner, I know that name. I know that name. And then he sent us a message, like saying, "Oh, he's here." So yeah, he was there last week. Jace was showing him around. He was having a bloody hell of a time at the Amilla Resorts and Maldives. So yeah, like you say, George, probably the only guy that into the competition. But no, I don't think so. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, great. yeah, we run a we, we run a smooth one. trip. We run a we run a. I, I think that Jonesy has declared this. He's declared. He's obviously very feeling very. And there's a bloke about, out there on ninety nine about to hit a century, and hmm. he's. It's like Pat Cummings, I mean, who, I mean, who that's enough uh, on the hat trick ball. Yeah, exactly. There could be a guy out there oh, about no. to hit a century. No, you're there. We got you. I, I think that. Okay, oh. Let, let's just let's just let's just slow down a bit here. Let's just okay. let's just pull the card up. Let's pull the card up, Jonesy. You've jumped the gun. That's your fuck up. You'll take the blame for that. George and I are not part of that. Um, there's two entries at the moment. That was one. Do you want to see the other one? I've got let's it. Play I've, the, done, I've done play, prep work. Nah. Let's play the let's play the second one. Mm. And then let's and say we've got one more. You've got George, one more week. Nah, nah. <laughs> sorry. Got... Sorry, Nick Hammond. George has shut you down. Nah, we've got to give him at least the chance to, for the punters to <laughs> yeah. see it. But, right. And we'll give we'll give everyone wait. We'll mm. give everybody one more week and mm. or two more weeks until our next show, which will be in two weeks' time. If we the intro for the next show was the same as today. Then what's his name? Uh, Peter Meffin. Peter Meffin has been declared Meffin the winner. Yeah. If we play a different one, which probably means that is it Nick Hammond who's done the second one? He's probably yeah. got a chance because he hasn't been played. So, but this one's fucking awesome. I reckon. All so right, play let's it. play it. Let's play it. Here we go. Welcome to the Social Distance Podcast with George Hincuppy and Johan Brunel. On this week's episode, we get. What? Oh, is that the one we're doing for the other bloke? What shirt, sure, tie, and everything. Welcome to the Social Distance Podcast with George Bennett, who could win a bike race as long as it's not too cold, Dan Jones, who has as much chance of winning a bike race as England do of winning a test match, and Sam Bewley, who's probably injured. George probably won't turn up, there's highly unlikely there'll be a special guest, and there's absolutely no way ever there'll be merchandise. Like, share, subscribe. Great. <laughs> That's actually really good. I like that yeah. one. 
I vote Bill. Dude, I've, I've watched that one a few times because I thought it was bloody funny. Um, and I just picked up on something that I didn't pick up on just when you showed it then, when he goes, does the Johan Brunel, George Hinkapi intro, and then he goes, oh, what? I've got a shirt and tie on and everything. <laughs> yeah, then puts the hoodie and the hat on. Yeah, it was great. I like that one. That's, that's but, not my vote. Good on Yeah, him. but the problem is, it, it's funny the first time you hear it, but, you know, you get halfway through the year, you go, oh, the gags aren't as good anymore. I think, you know, the music I do reckon one, that you might hit you when you're a bit sensitive. Do you reckon like, well, like I've just come back from Catalonia where I've just lost the GC because it's cold and I'm going, well, fuck you. I'm fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, well, you, you, you loved... just didn't like that photo. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was about 20 <laughs> kegs heavier. But I'll you love the, Jones, you love the national champs. Look... Well, I was just going to say, yeah. you won the national champs in the old intro and you were liking that for about two weeks and then that got stale. And you just were a grizzly bastard for yeah. six months of the middle there, and you can't do it at the end. I, yeah, well, I reckon I'll my, say... my my opinion, and we shouldn't be swaying voters because I think mm. we were going to take it to a public vote. Um, so we shouldn't be swaying voters. But if I was to campaign, I think that the second one um, was bloody awesome. Like it was fucking funny. It was accurate. Mm. I think it was great video great little clip that he's done and it deserves its credit i think he deserves um if he doesn't win i think he deserves something so we will send him something um merch. but in terms <laughs> what do you say merch, merch. <laughs> yeah he'll get the first lot of merch he'll get the first t-shirt that's right <laughs> um but the one that you have played is definitely more intro friendly if you know mm. what i mean mm. all right it's i'm gonna get down and um, we're getting bogged down in admin here, but Jonesy, you didn't like that photo on that intro, but I thought you looked healthier than you look right now. I don't know what's wrong with you. What's happened? Yeah, I, well, I think you do know what's happened. I've had COVID. Oh, I do know what's happened, but you <laughs> yeah. look... You you look ease me like, into that one. No, I don't feel 100%, I'll be honest. And um, Are you sweating gee, or have I just got a dirty screen? Yeah, no, I'm sweating. Um, my body's still not 100%, as I said. Like, I've lost my appetite a bit. My smell and taste is a little bit off. Um, but all I have to say is oh, – so, oh, I'll take you back through the start. I was a close contact to two mates that had COVID. And then it's like when you're close contact for two days, you're like, fuck, this is a tsunami ready to hit here. Like, it's just a matter of time. So then I got, you know – Inappropriate. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, you know something's coming. So – I then loaded up on the Panadol, Nurofen and aspirin because I had another mate who had COVID and he's like, mate, get on the aspirin. It fixes nausea and all that sort of stuff. Thank fuck I did because when it hit, it starts off with like a bit of a tickle in the throat. And I don't, you know me, mental, this could have been half mental as well. Like my brain's going, you probably no, didn't even sick. have it. You've just given it to yourself. Well, I had three rapid tests, all negative, and I had a PCR test negative, but I swear I had it. Like I had all the symptoms, <laughs> you know, fever. Um, I didn't shart, which was a po positive, but I, I, my guts was gone. Um, yeah, just chills, throat was gone. I've lost a bit of the smell and taste. But if I – like, I've had two jabs, and all I could think is fucking hell. Like, I don't get pissed off, you know, with the whole anti-vaxxers and we're sick of talking about it. But I'm like, mate, all the best. Like, work it out. You will work it out for yourself if you get it, if it's a good call or not. And it's a fucking good chance – you are going to be in the box, like. And the problem mm. is here, you can't, you can't get one of these fucking rapid tests. They're no, they're nowhere to be found. So, you know, you know, there's a crisis when KFC go, we're out of chicken. When KFC mm. go, we're out of chook. Like people are just losing their fucking minds. You know. You can get the rapid test here if you know Clark Gayford, I think. But... <laughs> Who's Clark Gayford? <laughs> is that? Just and his husband. <laughs> oh, just, yeah. Yeah, I'm making a can of worms there. Right, no, so it, has, happened. Like, it happened. Oh, yeah, it happened. Um, yeah. So you're right now. You're going you're gonna to pull through? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine now. Because once it goes out of your system, you're all right. The only thing is, yeah, I lost my appetite a bit. So that's actually probably not a bad thing. And with so the taste. Health benefits, you reckon? Yeah, with the taste, if I can't taste stuff, well, then I can start putting broccoli in smoothies and start boiling up some spinach for dinner. Like stuff that I don't normally like to eat, I can't taste it. So it's texture. So mm. I've got to really capitalize on this sort of window now and then strip a, a bit of the man boobs and then get back cherry ripe. Do you feel like it's I a think good I time to be doing that when you're unhealthy? Is it maybe not a good time to be 
The stripping right. calories? Well, it, it, good time to be eating veggies, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I reckon you need to be shooting for a big calorie deficit. I think yeah. I told the story here about um, the guy that was trying to, um, the New Zealand rider that was trying to lose a bit of weight before the Worlds in like, it was like 2004 or something. And there was he was racing in America and um, he couldn't quite strip the last bit of weight. So he got a, um, a like a burger from like just an actual burger, not like a Macca's burger, but like a, a, a proper burger that can be composed left mm-hmm. on the front dash of his car for a few days and then smashed it to give himself um, stomach gastro. Just shed. Yeah, gave himself gastro to shed a bit of weight. That's you, fucking you'd, insane. You'd argue that yeah. that's an eating disorder, eh? Like, I, I don't think <laughs> yeah. that should be encouraged to any budding young cyclist to be doing those it was At least an own goal. At least an own yeah. goal. Like, well, the most important question is, did it work? And how many kegs did he shed? Mm-hmm. Well, how did he go at the world? I think he got, I think he got shelled at the worlds. Because <laughs> he was crook. It wasn't world champ. It wasn't Bettini. The uh, the big global news boys, obviously talking about COVID, is the Novak's Djokovic decision. Bloody Man. shit show on both sides. Like what how a shambles. How he even got on the plane to come over, and then like that was a balls up. But then. I like how it all gets lost in the wash, but at the end of the day, it's the same thing. Everyone else has to get the fucking jab. So they're the rules. Like, that's it. Mm. Do we have to, girls, for cycling? Do we, like, if we, can we go to a race without the jab? I think, I think so. Yeah. I think so. I don't, which is nuts, eh? Yeah. I don't like, actually know the rules yet. I know that they're changing the rules around testing. Um, you know, obviously last year and the, in the, well, since the pandemic, since racing resumed after the pandemic hit. So since August, 2020 until this season, we've had to be doing two PCR tests when we go to a race. So we do a PCR test six days out from a race, a PCR test three days out from a race. And then obviously, you know, if there's a positive in one of those cases, you don't go to the race. I think, and I don't know for sure that the rules that may be changing around that testing protocol based on your Mm. vaccination status. Um, so I don't know if that means that yeah, if you're unvaccinated, you can still go to the race, but you maybe you have to follow that same protocol protocol still. Or I assume teams, if they have unvaccinated riders, will bring but in their own. But it would be strange protocols. because you can't do anything else without a vaccine. So you mm. can, but you can go to a bike race and snot yeah. and spit and everything. Does that not just seem like a a recipe for disaster? Well, when you see like what most industries around the world are doing, well, certainly this this part of the world, Australia and New Zealand, a lot of industries are saying, yeah, well, if you're not vaccinated by X amount of, by X date, mm. you, you no longer have a job. Um, whether or not they can apply that in in professional sport, I don't know. I think the NBA did it. Um, I think yeah. the NBA basically said, if well, you're not there's vaccinated, a bloke that's changing from um from rugby to uh, from Warriors to code because. Yeah. In RL, you need a vaccine pass, and I think in rugby, rugby you don't. Mm. And like, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Eh? It'd be interesting. I'm, I'm sure that will come out with the UCI. I, I had to I'm have sh- one to race the Tour of Wellington. I know that. And, yeah, and right. a team pulled out because one of the one of the owners um, didn't want to get vaccinated, so he pulled pulled his whole team out. <laughs> it's a bit selfish. Mm. How was the <laughs> New Zealand Cycle Classic? <laughs> Mate, it was a shock. It was um, it was real good, good week. But like we started, and we had this. Um, it started with a ten k team time trial. So it was me, Shane Archibald, friend of the show, um, Mike Phillips, who's an Iron Man, and two young kids. And have I forgotten someone? Oh, Lawrence Pithy, a you know huge talent, up and comer. So we were sitting there in the meeting like, okay, um, team time trial. I'm going to, you know, I was thinking like, right, me and Shane, we're going to be the engines here, 10Ks. So we'll probably just, you know, set the pace, probably pull some double turns. And you guys just, whatever you do, don't drop the speed. You know, and we're just like, we're just like hammering it into these guys. Just don't drop the speed. We've got to, we'll set the pace and, and just, just don't slow it down, guys. Okay. And thinking like we're gonna to have to be the, these heroes. Well, I was. Shane probably was a bit more quiet than me. But I was. I was just going. You know, like all right. So I started second because that's the sort of you know someone just does a start pull, then you get up to speed. So 
we line up to warm up everything. I was actually like, well, I'm a little bit like nervous. I haven't, I haven't done anything hard yet. Like any, I've t- trained really hard, but I haven't got any like actual like high power training. So we start off the ramp and the kid who's starting slips his chain, just flies to the left, like doesn't crash, but manages to keep it up. So I end up like, okay, well, I'm, I'm doing the start here. So I start to the first corner, turn left. And I'm like, right, well, I'm also going to just do the first pull. I'll just double up here. I'm just going to pull a double straight off the block. So I'm pulling this like long pull, swing off. And then I was like, oh yeah, that's that was pretty hard start. Like I went pretty fast. And then Lawrence Pisky came over top of me and he's just this massive engine and he just increases the speed about 5k an hour. I nearly don't get on. By the time oh, no. I come to my second pull, I'm just going, shit, I'm in real trouble here. And we're about 1500 meters into this 10k race. And I'm looking, Novi takes a pull. He comes back and I'm looking at him. I'm like, oh shit, he's in trouble as well. And I'm looking at like, so the, Mike Phillips, who's an Iron Man. I mean, he's doing 10 hour races. He's not doing 13 minute races. And then two young kids who were, you know, pretty good keeping the pace. And in the end, Nobby gets dropped. I'm missing turns. We are just hanging on for dear life. Like we're the two shittest guys in the team. <laughs> just <laughs> absolutely. And you know, like the whole thing about team time trials, you like, you've got to keep the speed. But we, like, Lawrence would just bring it up to this crazy pace. Well, what felt like crazy pace, you know. And then I'd come through and we'd just completely come off the foils, you know. like, And we would just drop down. And I'd be like, I was just trying to get my recovery on the front. So I'd knock off the speed about 10k an hour. We'd just bathtub, you know. Like, the team would spread across the road. And then he'd get it back up to speed. And then I was like, like, Nob, <laughs> Nob disappeared for about five minutes. And I just assumed he had dropped. But he was just hanging on about two meters off the back of the team the whole way. <laughs> he gets back on, does his death pull, and he swings off. And I was like, fuck, we've got, got to have four people to finish. We've lost a guy already. He's gone. And you know when, like, everyone has the same idea, everyone that's suffering goes, right, I'm just going to do my death pull, get out of here. And I think everybody had the same idea, like, oh, this is going to be our last pull. But then he just happened to do it so he could pull off first. And then I was like, oh, we've got to take this to the line. So four men absolutely hanging on, and we got our asses handed to us in such a big way. And that was a real humbling start to the year, I thought. It's nothing worse than being – you know you're, you're you're hurting when you know that the best place to be is on the front, the easiest place. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's yeah nothing, when you can slow it down. There's nothing worse than being like, the only place I'm going to get any recovery is in the hardest place because I can then at least ride my own yeah. pace. You're like – you know you're in the shit then. I had it at the Giro one year when I was oh. pulling with Chris Jill Jensen and I, was, and he was fucking storming on the climbs. And I was going good, but he climbed better than me anyway. And I remember just thinking, I've I've got to ride this climb on the front because if I have to ride behind Chris, he's going to fucking spank me. It's, yeah. It's not the... Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, you finished and fourth overall. It was just so though. funny because like... Oh, yeah, I made a good comeback from there. Well, it was weird because they needed to kill me early because like the first... like I came up about... 20% just from the team time trial because it was so we were just I was sharing a room with Shane and all night both of us just had like that deep pursuitous cough you know when you've, you and you're tasting that metallic it's like you're tasting blood you know and we're just coughing all night and I was like oh, we're on for a bloody COVID positive here just coughing up the because the first time you've gone hard in like months and months no you didn't have the and body then, aches mate don't tick all the boxes no nah, no could, 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 could still you smell didn't... So then you didn't, we, have, um, you didn't have three. You didn't have three negative PCR tests either to prove that you've got it. That's right. <laughs> yeah. No wonder there's no fucking rapids left. You've used them all. Yeah. Surely well, I've no, got well, it. Well, none of them fucking worked anyway. <laughs> you don't want them. Yeah. Don't worry right, about that it. was just the common cold. You've got it coming for you. Yeah. You Comment below. Just around the corner. Comment below. Did jo- Jones you have COVID or not? There's one option. Absolutely. Is COVID real? Uh, were you <laughs> purely racing to that team time trial when, um, I think it was the Vuelta, SOL was telling the story about when, um, I think it was 2017, when Steve-O fucked up in the radio. Yeah. And he was going, straight. full gas, full gas. Ah, oh, shit, go right, break. <laughs> yeah, there was, it was actually a pretty gnarly triple T. And it was in, um, in Harry's, I think, right down south. And it was, Scorching hot. The team, the triple T was the opening stages of Welter, and it had like it was something crazy, like eleven or twelve roundabouts in this fifteen k triple T. You know, just constantly in and out of roundabouts. Really hard, really hard triple T to get right. So I can imagine um, Steve-O, who would have you know reconned the course, 
a number of times. He was pretty meticulous at that. Oh, yeah. Though. And he would have had it dialed, but he's obviously just it's so many roundabouts. He's at a certain point, he's got confused as to where we were, or I don't know. And he's like, Right, guys, yep, this one's full gas through, full gas through this roundabout. And then we get halfway through the roundabout at about 55k an hour, and we're like, Fuck, left, <laughs> left. <laughs> he reckons it was like millimeters from people, the whole team eating shit. But then we finished third, we finished third there. I think you guys won, George. Um, oh, no, this is with um, Cannondale. And it was yeah. Sagan and all those boys. Yeah, yeah. Now we finished second. We got pipped yeah. by Movistar in the last. The, they were the last team. And we we finished third. And we there was like half a second between third and fourth. So I think it was Steve-O's call of making us go into this roundabout at fifty-five k now that we would have otherwise <laughs> gone to at forty-five. That got us the podium. So hats off to Steve-O. Maybe he's more meticulous than we think. That's right. Yeah, well, I had it last year in the tour. No, two years ago in the two thousand twenty tour on the Planche de Belfi's time trial, and like. I had a massive days coming out and depending on the jersey, and it was a penultimate stage. And like, oh, do you want to do recon? I was like, no, no, I'm not going to do recon. Because it was a long TT anyway, and just had to get through to Paris. And so he started, and I had a um, director in my car. First corner, he's like, okay, mate, down, turn right. So I go along pretty fast, downhill start. And then I went to, so I set myself up for the right hand corner, and as I was coming to the corner, I was like, I mean, left. <laughs> Oh. So I just went straight into the barriers. <laughs> while, while we're on um, TT, TT chat, I've got one good one. You might have been there, Jones. I think it was a 2013 Tour of Switzerland. And oh, yeah. we had a, we had a prologue and it was like a 7 or 8K prologue and it was sort of flat for a couple of K. Then we did this like 3K climb and then this like 3K descent, like technical descent to the finish line. And I started a minute in front of Fabian Cancellara. So I thought, well, I'm fucked. I'm going to get caught. Um, but I had this tactic in my mind that I was like, I was just going to go fucking full gas as hard as I can to the top of the climb. Fabian will catch me at the top. And then he's a mad descender. If I can just stay with him on the descent all the way into the finish line, then I'm only going to lose a minute to Fabian Cancellara. Back in those days, I mm. could have got second, you know? So yeah. I was, I went as fucking hard as I could to the top of the climb. And he caught me as we like crested the top of the climb. And I was fucking cross-eyed, man. I was like, holy shit, I've gone hard here. So then Fabian caught me, passed me just as we started the downhill. And I was like, righto, that's it. I just got to follow Fabian down this descent. Easier said than done, eh? <laughs> Is this where he was going 100k an hour? Um, no, nah, was, that was a TT later in the week, I think. But this was oh, quite, oh, a that was a quite a hairpin technical downhill. And I was following Fabian. I don't know how he did it, but he made around his corner. The Eels didn't. <laughs> well, that, that was... <laughs> oh, <laughs> what straight <laughs> Straight into the barriers, and then I, as as I hit the barrier, I my front wheel hit the the leg of the barrier and punctured. But I didn't know that, so I get back up, get my bike, hop back on it, do about two pedal strokes, and go to turn right, and the front wheel just washed out again. I just ate shit twice again, <laughs> <laughs> and then so I like limped into the finish line, and then I got on the bus, and all the boys were like, <laughs> "Well done, mate!" And I was like, "No, nah, no, nah, punch." I punched it. I didn't know. I didn't know. I knew. I knew full well. I punched when I hit the barriers, but I just claimed the puncher from the first crash. But I was like, no, nah, no, nah, I just punched it. I punched it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, as it Cam won out, that like second to last. Because because remember the conditions changed. Oh. Cam had like a tailwind when he went, and then no, nah, that the was time... different. You sure? That was, yeah, yeah, no, that, was, that, yeah was a, that was that was that was a different yeah. yeah. I reckon it could have been the famous Romandy prologue when. Um, so Victor Campanats, he's the current world hour holder record. He is this, do you remember the story of him? So it was like a start ramp and he had this position on his time trial bike where he couldn't see anything. He was like, basically like a track pursuit where you just see your front wheel and he wanted to stay super aerodynamic. So what he decided to do was count white lines to the, so it was you'd start really fast and hard right. And he was like counting white lines or he was counting something on the road like might have been like manhole covers and he knew there was like three manhole covers or like 50 white lines before the right corner and so he didn't have to look <laughs> oh that's he ballsy. obviously miscounted and just didn't break didn't do anything <laughs> straight into the fence didn't even, <laughs> didn't even start to turn the corner and put himself out of the race I remember Whitey telling me that when Zabriski, you know when Zabriski had that real aero position and Garmin and stuff oh, yeah. and like he, he just couldn't see anything and I th I'm pretty sure it was Whitey was telling me. If I'm wrong, it's not going to matter. But anyway, it was he was telling me that um, 
So Broski just said, I can't see anything. So you, you're you going to have to guide me. You're just going to have to talk me through this whole TT. So when he was going on the straight roads at 60k now with his head down, couldn't see anything. Why do we just have to say, oh, straighten up a bit, straighten up a bit mate. You're veering a bit to the left. Oh, getting a bit close to the grass. Straighten up. Straighten up. It's such just an unnatural thing. Him, right? Yeah. Have you ever tried it? Have you ever tried to like ride? Even if you look up, like I had a pretty, I've got a pretty hard to see position, but I look up and if I look down and I know I've got like 20 seconds to the corner, I still can't look, not look where I'm going for more than like a second or two. It's just such oh, yeah. an unnatural like survival hmm. response where there's just something about traveling at 50k an hour without seeing where you're going, wearing Lycra. Um, it's like when it's you... just such a survival. It's like when you're driving, do you ever drive and try to like I just like sometimes look in the rear vision mirror and just try to guide myself off the center line in the rear vision? <laughs> what the fuck yeah. are you talking about? <laughs> no, I don't do that. I, I'm it's the stupidest. Like, I, I got a mate that used to do these stupid competitions amongst mates from sale, and one of them was to see how long you could go without the windscreen wipers. And I said to him, That is the fucking most ridiculous thing. He goes, I go, but how long do you last? He goes, three months. One day it was just absolute <laughs> downpour and I just couldn't see shit, so I had to flick them on. Who the fuck does that? Like, risk your life just to say to your mate, still haven't used me wipers. Like, dickhead. <laughs> Blokes, women don't do that shit. It's something no. inherent chemically with males. We just, we're fucking idiots. Let's be That's honest. A it's a relationship to men on the dance floor. <laughs> yeah. Men yeah. behind the wheel. <laughs> yeah. But like there's a, there's a natural thing to see how far you can push everything. Like even just stupid shit like like I remember I had a couple of mates who were really, really good talented fighters and they were living in Belgium and they just tried to see how little they could live off. Which is not a good thing as a cyclist. I mean, I'm pretty sure one of them basically gave himself scurvy. And <laughs> they would do like no shit. So what he used to do, this is a good mate, he listened to the podcast, he's one of my best mates. And um, Scurbs, he, <laughs> yes, Scurbs. <laughs> and he, um, so when he lived in France, he actually raced for my amateur team after me, the year after me. And he used to go dumpster diving. So what would happen oh, is every night at like geez. 8 p.m., the the care for the supermarket would throw out all their fresh, all their food that was expired. And it was fine food, you know, but like, it was going off the next day, but it had just expired that day. So, you know, there's buns and breads and cakes and all this shit. And he used and to it was say coming out of a dumpster. To, <laughs> yeah. And it would all go into a dump, dumpster. So he reckoned that he would have to, like, line up and square off against all the homeless men in Morto <laughs> to fight for the dregs that were getting thrown out of the dumpster. And he used to survive off, off yeah, dumpster diving and stuff like this. But then a few years later, I went and stayed with him in Belgium. He was racing for a continental team up there. And he had this thing like in Belgium supermarkets, everything's free samples. And they got um, they got banned from the Del Hayes for just oversampling. And <laughs> we're just living off like just rice, basically. But rice was the cheapest bang for buck and canned sort of fish, essentially were the two things that they would eat, just rice and fish. And, and they just were just trying to, push everything to the extreme like oh man i got through with like five euros this week i was like well it's not really conducive to trying to be a professional <laughs> cyclist but i guess it's an achievement <laughs> i i live with a bloke that was pretty good with his coin and his favorite go-to was he'd starve himself all day but then he used to buy the the home brand uh garlic breads and you could get two sticks for two bucks so he could feed himself on a stick of garlic bread a night that was his oh. that was his go-to and the breath, oh, oh. shocking! Jeez, yeah. yeah. When when I come down to Christchurch for my uni mates, I just remember thinking like, so I'd, I was a pro already, and I remember coming down and just hanging out with them and living how they lived for a bit, like living their flatting situation. And because I never flatted, I never had the uni experience, or I never got to like, like I did the squalor side in France, like the poverty side there. But you're still a professional cyclist, so you still were clean and you were still looking after what you're eating and stuff like that even though we were broke and had a shit apartment, but like these guys were just, it was just so mongrel. Like, like I remember, so the dinner time was that all get, go to the, um, they get $2 kilos of mints. So like whatever meat you buy for $2 and a kilo of it is not meat. It's just 
No, that's Hoots lips and assholes. And yeah, yeah, that's just blended up shit. And so dinner was just fried mints on white death bread, like the budget style, mm. you know, the Pam's bread. And it was just mints on white bread. And I just remember that's just what they would murder. That would be their like one cooked meal a day, mints on toast. And then the rest of the time was just, and, and like shit like they'd drink a beer and instead of just putting it in the rubbish bin, we'd just biff it behind the couch. So behind the couch, there's just piling up of, of beers and like, like plants growing in the house, not because they planted them, but just because the carpet's worn through to the, you know, and just mud, and it was just filth. You know, the cold Canterbury winter. Filth, absolute filth. And I just never adapted to that. And I reckon like that's why I might get sick more often because those guys, they just harden their immune system up so hard from just, you know, basically living in a bacteria filled, you know, just all, mm. it went either one way. Either they gave themselves like a lung disease or they just have epic immune systems. And then, and then there's bound to be one of them that walks out of university going, oh, that was a tough 10 years, but I finally got my anaesthetist degree. <laughs> yeah. the fuck did yeah. you do that? <laughs> but I was going to... I, I was going to do a sh- sh- short film once on tight asses and I was going to make out that, um, oh, yeah. you know, there's been a scientific breakthrough and doctors have researched what part of the brain controls spending. And they've done a survey and they've worked out that tight asses have a deficiency in that part of the brain. And, and to treat them, they sent them to like rehab for tight asses. And when they're at the rehab, you know, they try and get them used to spending money again. So they play like a game of Monopoly, but they just keep going around the board trying to pass go, collect 200 bucks. Like it gets and fucking no nowhere. And no one's buying any properties. No, no. They're just counting their cash. And then I thought that also scientists, well, I think this is true. With tight asses, it's like a traffic light system. There's, you know, your red, your amber, and your, your green. Like the green tight asses are the one that are tight against themselves. They're not a problem in society. Yeah. You know, the mates that go, you know what, I'd love to go out, but I don't have the money, and they just punish themselves. The middle is the ones that dodge a couple of shouts every now and then, you know, that guy that sort of nicks off and you go, hey, what happened? Oh, wallet. mate, he's fucking gone, forgot his wallet. But they'll strategically pay for shit that's cheap, you know. Like they go, no, nah, I'll get that. I'll get oh, that $2 I'll get mint. This one. Yeah. Make a big. Yeah. But then you've got yeah, the yeah. red. They're the ones that consistently flick you. 24 7 you know they're the ones that you got to be careful of they're the ones that you got to go you know what i don't think we can invite him next time because he brought around a dozen beers and went home with 24 you know <laughs> like, i reckon there's a real mm. it's a real cultural yeah. cultural thing to tightness because like <clears throat> i don't know like uh, let's say for example george and i if we go out in Girona for um a coffee or you know on, on a ride we stop for a coffee or we stop for a or have it we have a beer one evening or whatever there's there's no tally being kept, but it just always be like, oh, I'll get this one, bro. Or yeah, it works know, itself then out. Just, then yeah. at some point, George, oh, I'll get this one. You know, it just and it, you know maybe someone's paid more than the other, but ultimately it works itself out. But here in New Zealand, I've noticed that when you go to the pub or something with your mates, it's a real just pay for what you had scenario, and that's like yeah. not. I don't think it's a tightness thing. I think it's just a cultural thing that like when you same mm. as when you go to a barbecue here at a friend's house on a Saturday night, you take your own booze like we spoke about the other week. You know, yeah. and then if you go to the pub and you, you know, you sit down and you order some beers and your dinner and you sit there for a couple of hours and you go up to the till and pay, you just pay for what you had instead of going, oh, let's we just split it three ways or whatever. Yeah, it's and this a, almost it, makes me uncomfortable in a way because, but even though it shouldn't, absolutely, it's, I'm, at, I'm at fault, but I go, oh, like, you know, and you end up going, oh, well, you're so used to just going, when they say, oh, I'll pay for what you had, you end up sort of going overcompensating and going like, oh, yeah, but... Surely know, I've missed you're something. You're so aware. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. And you're so hyper-aware that like, oh, okay, it's <laughs> but you know. But then you get the standoff. There's always like the bottle of water that's been ordered and shared between everyone. And you're yeah. like, ooh, yeah. who's paying for the water? You know? But the tight ass, <laughs> the strategic tight ass, so I wouldn't call them red. They're sort of more, you know, orange. They will always, in a chop-up like that, pay what you had will go last because you know how the till guy is always working out and then it gets to the very end and he goes what do i owe and they go well like what you were saying george there's always going to people yeah. that pay extras so they're the ones yeah, well, that pay at the very end like starter because say, say like you've gone right we've got some starters got some beers like oh I'll grab a couple of beers and some starters and and whatever i ate you know 
and then yeah then there's no starters and everybody's sort of doing that and then the the, the orange bloke he's mm. i mean the red bloke he's gapped it he's faked yeah. the phone call yeah. with his wife's in labor and he's gone oh, he didn't come he didn't come no. oh he didn't even come no, he's he green. Invited. Green didn't go because he's oh, punishing green himself. Was. Green's green okay. Red rolled up and he fucked the whole group. <laughs> yeah. He yeah. faked an emergency. Yes. And he's bailed. Yeah. Um, you know how you said it's a cultural thing? One thing I noticed, I've got a lot of time for the Dutch. I spent a lot of time with them. But holy, they, they're, they're tired, they hate man. spending money. They got fists in their pockets, so. though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they got mm. they got locks on the uh on the they got zipless pockets. Yeah. Mm. Um, I, I um, carry on. Continue. Oh no, no, definitely. I haven't got anything to say either. I was going to say that when I, when I was in France, I just had this random thought coming to my head while I was listening to you ramble on about when I was racing amateur in France. You talking about how you made money. There was a couple of tricks, and I know you that you did one of them, George, because I think you lived in Switzerland, didn't you? One point. Yeah. And is this the fifty cent coin? Yeah, the fifty cent New Zealand coin was the same size as a two franc coin. Which no, was about a five franc or a five, a five franc, franc, which is a, which is about ten New Zealand dollars back in those days, and so you could go to the vending machine and put a New Zealand fifty cent coin in, and just punch away and get your five francs worth of stuff for fifty cents or bloody fifteen of their cents, really, you know. So we said, like, I remember, Joy, I think you went over to Europe with a whole bloody bag of them once, didn't you? So I went over. I went and said <laughs> I went around the bank before I left because it was that was when they changed the coin, so it was an old fifty cent coin. And um, I went around all the banks saying like, oh, I actually need to try and get a few of these old coins. It's for a school project and things like that. And ended up having this huge bag of them. Go to a thing, buy a Kit Kat, get four francs back, spend it on surviving. And it was a, just an epic scam that's probably, I probably now have divulged this. I'm probably next time I do Tour of Swiss, there'll be a few gendarmes at the border waiting for me. But um, yeah, that was a great, that was a great way of getting around. Great way to survive over there. It would have cost Brilliant. you 12, 1200 euros to get the coins over there next to luggage, probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I um I used to when I was racing amateur in France, we used to catch the carp off the town river, the town bridge. It was like a legal oh, fish. Fucking eat those, did you? Oh no, fuck no! I didn't eat them, but we sold them to the local crepery for two euros. <laughs> what does so the we crepery like, do with them? Put them in their crepes, like a fish crepe. Carp crepe. Know. That'd be. Oh, shit. you should not eat those things. Oh, no, I didn't go to that crepery. I went to that crepery for oh. one reason only. That was the cash and the the, the carp that I'd been. F- carp are like the the gutter rats of the of the rivers. Like they are shocking. Yeah, you should, oh, you've all seen the ones in Girona. These things are massive, yeah. massive. And I've always thought, like, oh, could you eat those? And then everyone, they just a stinky. What What were they doing? Were they advertising like a carp crepe, or were they pretending it was like a blue cod or something? Yeah, that would just be. That would have just been a fish fish crepe or i don't know a I heard, crypto, a f- crypto, crypto cup crypto poisson for starters you're not going to oh. have a you're not going to have a fish crepe anyway and then secondly if you saw us rolling in with a bucket full of carp fuck you wouldn't be going that place no oh, no but it funded our like, um, um nights out yeah well do you reckon it's like um encouraged like i remember when i was a real young kid we did this holiday in queensland and um we went out with golf clubs this is probably a bit of a violent story but we used to go cane toting so we're just because all the all the cane toads would sit around the um lamp posts and we'd just go and basically practice your golf golf swing on them and all the locals were like yeah good stuff boys go get them because obviously a huge plague of these these toads that were just taken over and decimating various populations of insects and 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 Sugar. I guess small fish and whatever I don't know, but um, and I remember it being really encouraged, and we were like doing God's work, you know, out there just absolutely <laughs> murdering these little cane toads. It was quite a violent thing, but it was really encouraged. So I wonder if that's the same with carp. If, if the locals just love you to go and smoke all their carp. Well, I've started following this. This is a fucking good episode, eh? I've started following this. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're wormholed in a big way, eh? Yeah. I love it. Wasn't I talking I start- about cycle castle? <laughs> yeah, and it turned started- into tight asses and carps. Dumps I started following this, this group on Instagram called the Bald Carpers, and they just go, <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm pretty funny. Be just, I'm going to look them up. These British dudes that go out and just fish carp, but they're like... um. <laughs> Like they're conservationists, effectively, and they 
they care about carp health and all that stuff. So they often ca- they'll they put the carp back, but they'll catch them for for game, I guess, or for sport or whatever you call it. But then they'll like treat them before they put them back. So they'll, they'll take the hook out and then they'll put an antiseptic rub on their wound and like do oh, all these geez. things to care for the carp oh, before wow. they put it back in. But they're pretty they're quite funny. Yeah. Anyway, there should, um, uh, should be a carp <laughs> cooking show just to show that it is possible. Uh, Jeez, these are monsters! Holy oh, shit! Mate. Have you seen River Monsters? That show? There's some yeah. big bastards on that show. Oof. Yeah. So, Bills, you're getting ready, and same with you, George, to head off from New Zealand. Are you? Is your prediction come true? Like when we were talking in December, you're saying right as you get near the end. George is all about the demons and Buell's went the other way. He's like, nah, I've got a tight relationship with the old man. How's the final preparations going? I've got three more days left, so I'll start the run tomorrow. Um, Mm -hmm. No, no, I've I've got, I'll leave on Thursday. So it's been a bloody good summer back here, actually. I must say, you know, there's three things that get spoken about when you're in New Zealand. One is COVID, obviously. One is the property prices and one is the weather. And uh, I must say the weather's been unreal. It's been the best summer of record. I haven't had a drop of rain. I'm sure the farmers would love some rain, but there's been no rain. It's been bloody hot. It's been a good summer, real good summer. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I've, I've sort of, like, I, I came in a bit grumpy early on, I think, into the old man's household, but I've sort of simmered down a bit, and I've been running, trying to run as more of a consistent sort of playing field. Mm. Um, so I'm feeling okay about things at the moment. I, I went down and played pool with him, eight ball pool, Mm. Uh, the other night and uh, I like to do that you know once or twice when I'm home and but fuck man he's just so good he's so good he absolutely I can see him being a bit of a shark eh? I can see him being a bit of a oh it's the old 10,000 hour rule you know you Mm. do 10,000 hours at any then you'll master it he would have clocked up 10,000 oh 30 I think I've told this story multiple times about your old man (laughs) I've probably told this yeah I've told it a hundred times but it's still my (laughs) tell it again (laughs) no don't tell it again (laughs) <laughs> no, I didn't tell it again. But man, it's a greater story. Um, go back and find it in about fifty episodes ago. Um, but I can imagine him being a being a hard man to beat at any kind of pub game. Do they play He's for good. cash down there? Is there no, like no, no. cash games? That's all just no, fun. They don't play. They play like um, they play quite a difficult rule set that I don't understand. They so I when I go down there to play with Dad, he'll play. He plays with the same group of guys. You know, four or five guys that, you know, they're all sharks as well. So it's actually quite good sometimes just to sit there and watch because they're bloody good. Mm. But they play this rule set that I don't understand. I have fucking no idea what it what it is. No idea. And so I don't I don't dare um and you know jump onto their table and fuck their games up with pub rules. But me and the old man will just grab another table and just play. We just played like five games of pub rules, mm. and mate, it was five minutes of. God, you of have to do. You have Dax down in New Zealand. Like, if you don't pot a ball, you got to do three Mate, laps with your pants around your ankles. I left mm. the pub nude. Yeah. With no car. With no car. <laughs> and do you have the where it's right on the edge? You can put the stick in and move it out, like pub rules. Yeah, like just pub rules. Oh, yeah. Like, you're allowed, you're allowed a stick's length from the side, aren't you? Yeah. Oh, no, we weren't playing that. We we're having to play. I was having to like play them off the cush, off the cushion. Uh, um, but otherwise, just general pub balls, big smalls. And then black one at the end, yeah. standard. But yeah, he gave me some pointers though, which helped my which helped my game. But no, nah, no good. But anyway, hey, yeah, like it's good. Go. You're you're excited to go, and I was just feeling a bit smug. You know what I mean? Like, I was just been talking to like pretty much everyone I know has got COVID over there. It's mm. been well, it's actually been all right weather, but you know, I just feel like I shouldn't be too smug. Like here, training in the sun, seeing all my mates, doing everything good. Like everything's going well. Because I just know what's waiting for me. And you know, like, actually, I talked to a good mate, Hippie, this morning. And he told me it's been, like, amazing weather the last while over there, you know. And he's he's over in Jerona, so it's been really good weather. And it just made me sort of, you know, I just went, oh, yep, that's pretty standard. Because it will wait till we get back and it will mm. absolutely shit itself. And it's going to be freezing cold. You know what I mean? Whereas those guys are coming out of it. They've sort of got a bit of hard into it and... Do you, do you know what I mean about the smugness that you get over yeah. here? Like it's just, it's just all a bit too easy. And we're living mm. the complacent life over here with the virus as mm. well. I don't mean to go back onto that shit, but like ultimately, you know, you've we've got it pretty good here. We're stepping back into the lion's den as soon as we touch down, and yeah. probably probably Dubai. I reckon I reckon we've got we're safe until Dubai, and then the moment you get on the floor in Dubai, just you know, yeah, part of the each man for squid, himself, part of the squid game by then, eh? 
So mm. you got to go back in there and just red touch, light, try and... green light. <laughs> yeah, you'll be back over there. Like... had a, a great drinking game. Sorry, I've just completely. Yeah. So you know the song on that. You know the song on that. Um, Squid Games. The and then it stops. And everyone mm. has to freeze. Mm. We had a night out with one of my new teammates, and we got back to the hotel and just started playing that game. He just got it on YouTube, and then we just started playing it in the room. And it's actually a very fun game. And, it, and if you move, if you move, you have to drink. It was a good it's off-season a, game. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good drinking game, actually. It is. It's better than getting shot in the head. Mm. <laughs> just better, shot yeah. down your throat. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, sorry. But yeah, Are no, you... you're right. Heading back in, and the season kicks off straight away, man. Because um, What are you doing? I land, uh, I live on Thursday, so I land on Friday. And then uh, six or seven days later, I start racing already at Mallorca. The Mallorca mm. Challenge there, or whatever they call it. It's five. Oh, have you, have six, you done that before? Oh, my first year pro, 14 years ago. So um, oh, a long wow. time ago. Yeah, but it's it's quite an interesting race. It's five stages, and there is an overall winner. But each day is an individual race. So you, you don't actually have to do all five days. But obviously, is you don't like do all five days. Is it like a best of three situation? No, no, you have to do to win the overall title. You have to do all five. So, oh, but a lot of guys don't. Eh? A lot of guys just do no, like a lot two of guys or don't. three. Or yeah, yeah, which is what I'll I'll be doing. I think just uh, three days in Mallorca, and then pretty much straight into Tour of Valencia from there. So it's that's it's that's a smart way of doing those early season races. I reckon that's brilliant. Because mm. mm. yeah, the be, worst is so I'm a, I remember the year Happy and Beppu went over to Tour of Cali in 2013. Missed the time cut on the first day, and they were they were out. So that to mm. sit around the hotel the whole week just going, oh, fellas, so I just hope you're training right like that out of the race. <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. Missed the time. Oh, the first day. It, was, it was stinking hot. Remember that one? There was one day that was oh, like 50 no, degrees on the road. I remember Cookie Zodomino was like through the roof. Oh, is that when those guys crashed and they, they I heard about this, they, those, those blokes crashed and then they got like quite serious burns because they were lying yeah. on the road unconscious. Yeah, and they got really bad burns. I I did hear about that. That was pretty yeah. crazy. It was um, stinking hot. Just before we go, I want to tell you a funny story that happened to me yesterday. Um, it's 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 sort of circling back to our whole road rage incidents. But I was out riding, and um, I was riding in Christchurch here, and this this car was coming towards me on this real narrow road, and this guy decided to pass me, and he he essentially hit me like he was basically brushed me like you could you couldn't get closer without hitting me umpire's call like straight up yeah umpire's call sort of hitting hitting off stump and i straight away just reacted badly and went straight up like fuck you double fingers and then this guy 100 meters later pulled into his driveway and i was like oh is he pulling in to have a crack or is he actually driving to his driveway and it turns out he's driving down his driveway and i sort of pulled over and went oh, I'm pretty angry but I don't really want to go into somebody's house and then he was sort of parked in his driveway and I was like nah actually fuck it so I went down the driveway and this guy jumps out of the car this kid he's probably like 20 25 or something and I I, I was sort of like instead of being angry I was more like mate like what 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 were you thinking what were you doing you 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 know went off a little bit like you fucking nearly killed me like what are you Going on a bit of a rant at him, and he just sort of looked at me and goes, "Oh, yeah, sorry, mate. Um, um, I haven't been in a good headspace lately." And I went, "Oh, oh no, oh, no. <laughs> he's applied for the mental health exemption." Oh, oh no! And I went, "Oh," but I was still angry, and I was like, "Oh, but um, well, you know, shit." <laughs> and he's like yeah it's not an excuse is it i was like no it's not an excuse it's like, only yeah. gonna make things worse knocking off and a bike like, rider i was like well okay please be careful and he's like yeah I'll, you know and i was like and then i ended up being like but but you look after yourself man like you need to you know, <laughs> i went the other way no, that's good though way. Yeah, and started him to be like, oh, I'm a bit worried about this guy, you know. And I was like, Well, you just, you know, you just keep you hang in there, bud, and uh, <laughs> you look after yourself and have a good day. And I guess I'll see you later. 
And then I was riding on the driver like, fuck. <laughs> That's the way to do it though because, mate, it's, it's, I had this conversation with my old man the other day about high-performance sport. Like, you know, this is, if you want to relate it to real life situations where people make mistakes, they're aware of it. Mm. They feel guilty about what they've done. And you, yeah. you, then you, there's always the argument. Do you get up them or do they, do they don't, you know, like if someone drops a catch in the slips, do they need to be told why the fuck you dropped? Well, clearly they didn't yeah, want to drop yeah. it and clearly they know they're fucked up. Yes, they do need so to. So no one needs to tell them more than them. Because yeah. it's a soda. So you acknowledge, you, you acknowledge that you say, look, mate, you made a fucking mistake, but then you, you try to help them and. So good job, George. Yeah, well, done, George. Yeah, but I, yeah. I, it was so disarming. I've never been disarmed like that. And if yeah. anyone ever comes at me that hot, I'm just going to tell them I'm not in a good headspace. I'm really sorry, mate. Yeah. So, so yeah. You, are you letting the demons come out? You got three days till you head off as well. Are you going to go the whole demons thing, or are you no nah, give it a miss this year? No, nah, no, nah, I've got a bit more time here, and concerningly, I'm having far too much fun. Really loving being in. I'm actually doing like a bit of a baby tour at the moment. I'm down in Christchurch to see all my see all my mates who've all had kids. So I'm meeting all these new babies and stuff, which is pretty cool. And Uncle I watched George. Nationals last night. Watched yeah. um, Shane Archibald win. Actually, oh, I've probably gone way over time here, but um, Shane no had it. I was watching the race last night. And Shane, so we were, I was going to race the Crit Nationals and then my team sort of made the point like, well, there's only two outcomes. One, you crash, or two, you humiliate yourself and get dropped. So don't do it. Well, fair enough. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I was just roadside. We parked up at a pub there with a bunch of my mates and watched. And I was watching Shane. And um, at about 10 minutes ago, so it was 45 minutes plus a lap or whatever. And at 10 minutes ago, he was just grimacing, you know. And I was like, oh, man, he's in trouble here. He just had this big grimace on his face, shaking his head. And then he won. And I was like, I saw him straight in. I was like, I thought you were about to get dropped, mate. And he's like, ha, so did everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he, was, <laughs> and he was just playing with them. And then he just pumped them in the sprint. So it was quite good. Uh, it's awesome. He's but, uh, no, I'm, yeah, I'm back to Nelson and everything's, everything's going concerningly well, having far too much fun. So um, I'll need a, need a bloody ruffle some feathers before I go and help mm. me get on that plane. Yeah, I'll be well, up in the door in a you... few days, George. You want me to go and rebuild your garden shed that collapsed in the snow? Or oh yeah, sauna and shed. Get those things constructed. <laughs> That'll be fantastic. The sauna's still do... standing, I think. And do oh, you want the, the shed won't be. before we go? Bill's a couple more entries for the intro, mate. It's still not done yeah. and dusted. All right, so we got the like we said earlier in the show. We've Jonesy's jumped the gun, played one intro. Uh, it's a great one. We played another one, which is also a good one. We'll give you guys two more weeks. So mm. on the next show, which is in a, yeah, roughly two weeks' time, um, we will announce the winner who will get a, a national champions jersey from George. And oh, yeah. um, and if we deem you to be a credible entry, like uh, mate Nick Hammond, is it Nick Hammond, I think? Yep, Nick Hammond. Yeah. Um, we'll get you something else as well. So plenty yep. of incentives to to um, get an intro in and plenty of incentives for us so that we don't have to fucking make our own one. That's it. Like, share, subscribe.